All right, calling Greg Keeler of TSOL. Hello. How you doing, man? Hey, this is Mecca. How's it going? Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, pretty Excellent. good. Excellent. Excellent. Pleasure to talk to you. I was, um, I know you most from your TSOL work, but since this is recorded, um, can you introduce yourself to those out there who will listen to this as to who you are? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm Greg Keen. I write music for film and TV. I play in TSOL, and I've played with a bunch of bands over the years, including Bob Dylan, Berlin, The Church, uh, who else? A couple of other good ones. Ian Astorberg from The Cult, um, and some various and sundry other people. <laughs> You've played with Bob Dylan? I did, yeah. It was right after TSOL. I want to hear um, this story. It, yeah, yeah, it's pretty weird. Well, I I was in a video for the song Sweetheart Like You and it was um off the Infidels record and so it was with this guy. I was just it's funny because a friend of mine uh let me get my glasses out of the house. Uh, a friend of mine from the punk scene and everything her dad is Stephen Douglas who played sax with Dylan and um he, she shared a house with Dylan's manager at the time, this guy Gary Schaffner, and so they were looking for younger musicians to be in this video, and so I was like the guy, the punk keyboard player guy. So it was like, <laughs> so I got, so I got cast in this video, and so I got to go do this video with Bob Dylan. But then he, we kind of got along, like he liked me, and and the, the cool thing was this, the drummer on the gig was uh, Charlie Quintana, who was the drummer for the Plugs. And I really loved the plugs, man. I never, I had never met him, but the plugs are great. And he was the best drummer. He passed away last year, but oh, he's good. really, really great. He wound up playing with Social Distortion for a long time. Um, but, but yeah, Charlie was the best, man. I used to love uh, plugs. Were like, we were the same age. He was like sixteen, playing with the plugs. And I, my first punk show I ever went to was the plugs. So that was cool to get to play with him. So we got to be really good friends. And we and Bob really liked both of us, so he said, "Well, you guys should come up to the house." So we were, I would, I was living in Orange County, so I'd drive up to Hollywood, pick Charlie up, and we drive up to Bob's in in Malibu and just jam with Bob all day. And record, we would record stuff, and do, we didn't really do a record with him, and we didn't really do a tour, but we were just like Bob's house band, you know. Holy shit. And then, me, yeah, me and him and then a, a revolving door of guitar players and bass players for a couple of years. Like, we just, you know, whatever. It's on and off for a couple of years, you know? It's crazy. Yeah, it was pretty cool. It was I'm weird. I was 19, away, you know? So. 19? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was 19 when it started. And it, yeah, so it was, like, crazy playing with Bob when I was a kid. Wow. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's my Bob Dylan story. <laughs> At least you have one. Yeah, yeah. Jesus. And you can find the videos on YouTube. You can see it. It's a sweetheart like you. You can see me. Yeah. I look like my son, Max. Yeah, I just looked on your on your Wikipedia because I know you best from Beneath the Shadows. That's how I became. That's how I read your name on the insert there. Because um, funnily yeah. enough, I'm growing up. I've only had the Beneath the Shadows tape for about a couple of years now. I never knew oh, okay. who the oh, cool. keyboardist, who the pianist was on that album. I thought maybe Jack just was doing it because I could honestly see him playing the uh -huh. keyboard. And then I got the tape, and I was like, oh, "Yeah, he bro. played a little keyboard. He played a little bit, like you know, they did a little couple. Like he was trying out doing a little bit of keyboards, you know, before I joined and stuff. And they would, you know, so he plays a little bit, you know. So it's uh, it was sort of the yeah. So that, but no, they. I was a PSL fan, dude. I mean, I was going to see them at the Cuckoo's Nest, you know. Yeah, I mean, because they're, they're a little bit old. They're a couple, they're a couple of years older than me, mostly overall. You know, I mean, like Ron's only a year older, and Mike and Jack are both two years older. And so, um, yeah, so I was going to see them. I mean, they were this is best, man. Just go to see TSOL Cougars Nest is like insane. I mean, those Huntington Beach punks is like fucking shark frenzy, you know. But I always really liked them and thought they were cool. And then we had a mutual friend and. They were looking for a keyboard player, and you know, it's just like you know, they they came over to my parents' house. I had a little studio at my parents' house, <laughs> like this little ten by ten. We built a room inside the garage for my music shit, you know, which yeah. was super cool. My folk cool to do that, so I had this little little music studio in the in the garage. It was tiny, but I had all of my gear crammed in there and everything. And so they came by and just you know met and 
it's funny. I remember there was like this Elton John songbook, and Jack's like, "Can you play that?" <laughs> I go, "Yeah, well, what do you want me to play?" You know, I was a little classical piano. Key. I studied classical music, so I could pretty much play anything I wanted to, you know, within reason. But you know, it wasn't hard to be able to play an Elton John song or whatever. And so I remember playing that, you know, playing some stuff and played them some tapes, and they got to see all my shit and whatever. And so it just—I remember when they were driving off, they go, "Jack goes, don't take any wooden nickels." And the next thing you know, they called me up and said, so come on down and we want to play with you. And so then, yeah, so I joined for Beneath the Shadows and and um, and then, you know, we did a bunch, did, did a tour on that record. And then we broke up and they did Joe Wood. So I was only really in well for like a year at first, you know, and then, but but then me and Jack started this band, Cathedral of Tears, and there's oh, a demo you, you're out. you're on Cathedral of Tears too? Yeah, but not on that record because oh. this, happened. this is some good TSL history for you. So, um, yeah, so we did this demo. Now, there's a demo on Burger, which I gotta actually contact them because they went under. But there's oh, it's, it's online and stuff. Good. You can hear the Cathedral of Tears, Cathedral of Tears demos are up. You know, they're up on on YouTube and stuff. Just search Cathedral of Tears demos and you'll find it. But anyway, so we had this band. It was our band, you know, it was our band. It was like, you know, we were kind of doing a little bit more sense stuff, but dark, you know, a little, a little not super dark, but, you know, a little poppier, a little synthier, yeah, a little goppier, whatever. Oh, okay, yeah, so it was, in, it was the beginnings of that. One of those songs, you know, some, a couple of those songs, just songs me and him wrote, although I didn't plan it. But we kind of had a falling out because he was bummed that I was doing this Bob Dylan gig. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, the guy's paying He's a legend, and he's it's paying me to drive to Malibu to do this. I know, but he's just, we've had this a few times in our history, you know, where it's just like he'll get pissed off because I'm doing something with somebody else or whatever. And so so we had a falling out, and it's like, okay, well, whatever, you know, so I, I won't be in this band. I'm busy doing this other shit anyway. So, you know, so then they 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 did it without did that record without my involvement but uh, except for some songwriting but whatever it doesn't matter it's all water under the bridge now but the original version was really cool it was mike and well mike Patton was in it you know even in that version but he I, um you know he's the bass player for middle class I and he know played that, bass man. in cathedral of tears yeah yeah and they're great i love middle class i mean i still do they're, they they're great out man. Of Vogue, seven inch oh so good isn't it oh yeah. my god they were like the wire of the united states or something you know what i mean or the fall of california or something Some i mean people, they were like post-punk yeah. they were post-punk before post-punk was post-punk you know what i mean like yeah, they were post-punk during punk some people consider them to be the first yeah. hardcore band yeah, yeah you could i guess so but i always thought of them more in the lineage of like wire and stuff like i don't I guess they're hardcore, but I don't know. Hardcore is such a weird word because it's they're like fast. It so much. Yeah, I get. Yeah, I suppose. And that in those terms, yeah. But but in but from a post punk standpoint, you could listen to it from and think of you know bands like The Fall and Wire and stuff like that. And you, and I think they're in that lineage and Gang of Four even. You yeah, know what I mean? Like yeah, there's that, that side of it. That's sort of how I see them. But yeah, I guess yeah. If, if, you know, they should they get they should get any accolades that they that anybody wants to give them because they were great. It's such a great band, and very and, um, known today. I know, yeah, they're 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 one that really mattered, you know. And it's a shame Mike Ada passed away, or Jeff Ad, Mike, I guess Ada, one of the Ada brothers, passed away a few years ago. And uh, before he died, I went to see him. He had this shop in Fullerton, and I bought this really cool electric 12-string guitar from him. And I kind of wanted to go in there and buy something just because it was like, I knew, you know, it was hard. He's going through cancer treatment and all that. But I have this guitar that I'll always rem that I, I still have it. But it's, it's actually really cool. It's like a, not a Japanese 12, electric 12-string. 12 and um, so that's why Mike had a guitar. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, but I always liked Mike Patton, especially because he produced the, um, you know, the adol first adolescence record. That was, you know, between middle class and producing the first adolescence record, I was like, this guy is like so important, you know. But I always dug his bass playing, and I wanted to. I it was my idea to get him in Cathedral of Tears. I was like, man, if we had to, do, you know, 
we should get Mike Patton because Jay Bentley was actually in an early version of Cathedral of Tears, funny enough, from Bad Religion. Oh, Jay Bentley? Yeah, yeah, Jay played with us for a minute. Damn. I mean, we didn't do shows with him, but, but but we were doing some recording and we were playing around trying to figure out who should be in the band. Jay came down and we recorded some songs with Tom Wilson, who did the TSOL. I don't know what happened to those recordings. They're, they're gone, but... But we did it. We did some demos with Tom Wilson and Jay played on those. And yeah, so anyway, so that's the whole, that's the Cathedral Tears part. <laughs> and so, um, but yeah. And then me and Jack did a thing together called the Men's Club, like in the late 80s. I don't know about and, this one. And, uh, oh yeah, that's on, that's out too. It's out. You can find it. It's on YouTube. It's on Spotify and YouTube. By Jack or be on Spotify. Have... Vicious Circle, TSOL, the, Cathedral of Tears, and Joy Killer. Now we got Men's Club is in there. And then we all, me and Jack also, I'll, so I'll just run through all the Jack shit. Just, <laughs> so we did Cathedral of Tears, and then we did, there's this thing called the Men's Club, which was like kind of like Blow Monkeys, or we probably don't know that band. But, you know, just like Style Council, that kind of thing, you know. We've always kind of done well. We, we, a lot of times we'll just write those kinds of songs together just because we got that in us too, you know. So we did the men's club, and we like shopped it around and all that. And nothing really happened with it, but um, but that that's out. Like Burger put that out, I think. I think I think there was a Burger cassette of the men's club. Yeah, I think that's one of the ones we did with them. So yeah, so and then and I had Tinder. Well, he was in Tender Fury too. Don't forget Tender Fury. I know them. Yeah, and I produced some Tender Fury demos like we always every you know every few years we'd always like re get back together and figure out something to do you know but then there's a there's this record called jack grisham and the west coast dukes it's on spotify that's really cool that me and jack did I think i've heard uh, of about five yeah like five or six years ago and we had, had i played everything on it but we did have mike mccready come and play some solos and he did really cool shit from pearl jam because he was hanging around down here a little bit and friends with Jack and we had some mutual friends and he was cool, man. He just like, just came over and played some really cool guitar on a few songs. And so he's on that record and that's on Spotify. The, um, Jack Grisham and the West Coast Dukes. And that's just me and Jack and this really great backup singer. We had, well, we had some guest musicians, but pretty much, you know, it's that, that, that was that. And then Mike McCree came and guested on that. So, Damn. yeah, so. I just learned a lot yeah, in 15 always... minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you a history lesson, dude. <laughs> I didn't honestly know half of that. Wow. I was yeah. going to say, I don't no, listen I to this band at all, but I know about Berlin. What's your affiliation with them? Oh, okay. So, yeah, Berlin's an Orange County band, right? So they, they came up. There's a studio where we recorded that uh, Cathedral of Tears stuff. That's, called, that's a studio called the Casbah. And so, and they had recorded, like, Berlin did a lot of demos there and recorded their first EP there. And, you know, there was always just this kind of, I knew the guy, Mac, Mike Patton, or not Mike Patton, sorry, my, uh, what was that dude's name? Um, Van, uh, Dan Van Patton was the guy who produced the first Berlin record. And he had wound up having this studio in Orange County. And I did a lot of sessions there. Like he liked me a lot, and so I would come and play keyboards on records and do drum programming for him and all this stuff. And I forget the name of the studio, but it eventually became Doctor Dream Records, and so like Cadillac Tramps, and they're, they're the most known band from that scene. But anyway, there was this kind of connection because I knew, so I was sort of known to them a little bit, and they were known to me. And it was funny because uh, Jack, where Jack grew up on Ladoga Street in Long Beach. He lived across the street from this guy who actually was the second keyboard player in Berlin, like before me, you know, like in the mid eighties, like their second record order. And so I knew this guy, Matt, and we were friends, you know, it was cool. And it wasn't because of him that I got the gig, but it was just, it just, you know, I mean, there's only so many like younger keyboard guys that are working and all that stuff. And so they heard about me. And so it was just, they had disbanded that band that my friend Matt was in. And they just, yeah, they, I knew they were looking for a keyboard player. And, you know, I knew enough people to kind of get in that, get, you know, go get an audition. And they liked me. And, you know, I did a record with them, the Count Three and Pray record, which is, that's the, 
that's the record that has take my breath away on it. And then we did this big world tour, like 86, 87, um, um, you know, with all that song. Cause that was a huge song. That song was a big hit, you know? And so, so we got to travel the world, you know, I got paid to go. It was the first time I'd been, you know, a lot of places, you know, some, we just like went to Asia and, you know, whatever, went to all over Europe and all over the States. And in Europe, we opened up for Frankie Goes to Hollywood, which was insane. Like, I mean, Frankie Goes to Hollywood in 1987. I mean, it was freaking nuts. Like every night you're playing to like 30, 40, you know, 30,000 people. Um, you know, and then I got to be friends with those guys. So, because it was interesting, like Frank goes to Hollywood, you think, oh, they're this jazz band thing. But the thing about them, they're from Liverpool, right? So the two, there's these two singer dudes who are gay, but then there's the lads. So there's Mark, Ped, and Nash, who are like these like rough and tumble Liverpool guys, you know? And that's, people don't really know the whole thing with that. And they're all cool. Like, it, it's, Holly's a little weird, but all singers are weird, so whatever. <laughs> but the back of the other back of the gay back of the center, dude, Paul, was super, super cool. But the three guys were just these partying Liverpool guys, right? And they're like rock stars. They're cute. I mean, the big. Like, they're super fucking popular, man. I mean, this is after Relax. This is like touring their second record, but they were still really, really big. So we're opening up for them. They really liked me. And so I do my little set with Berlin and then watch the Frankie set. And then it was just like crazy fucking party every night. It was the 80s, dude. I mean, it was nuts. Like, it was crazy. Because <laughs> everybody wants to have a big party you do a big show and everybody wants to have a party. And so they're like, come on. You know, like I was part of the crew. Like you, ha I have to go, you know, it's like, you know, you're coming with us, man, you know? So it was super fun. And I wound up, it's funny because Marco Tool, the bass player from Frankie's and I got to be good friends. And then he moved out here and he actually built my studio that I am in standing in right now. <laughs> he, he's a, he's a fucking badass carpenter and he was living at my house. And so, and he was just like, no, let's, what, you want to build, let's do it. Let's build a studio. I know how to, you know, so I'm looking at my booth right now and Marco Tool from Frankie Goes Hollywood built it for me. So that's pretty rad. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so that's the, that's, that's the Berlin part. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so that was super fun. I read on your Wikipedia yeah. that you have uh, played in X before. Yeah. Okay. That's a good one. Yeah. So X, I've always been a big fan of X, man. I mean, I saw them in high school, you know, I, am I, mean, a, I, remember, uh, I reviewed yeah. love X. Yeah. They're great. Right. And I reviewed, I reviewed Los Angeles for my high school newspaper, Holy you know, shit, that's awesome. I mean, that's how cra that's how crazy that is. Cause it came out like right when I was in high school, you know, and I went to this like all boy Catholic high school called Servite <laughs> in Anaheim. And, and I was like me and a couple of my friends were the only punks, you know, and it's all like jocks and academics and it's just, it's a jock school. You know what I mean? It's a football school yeah. and that's cool, whatever. And I wound up being friends with a lot of those dudes and, you know, sell them a little weed and then all of a sudden they're your buddies or whatever. But, um, <laughs> but it was nice. fine. You know, it was, it was cool. And I, I enjoyed, uh, and so, yeah, so it was crazy. I reviewed X's record and we used to go see him. It was crazy because when I was in high school, we all, ha we, you know, that was the age when it was easy to get, like, fake driver's licenses. I mean, they weren't even fake. They were actually, like, legit driver's licenses because we would all go, we'd go to the DMV and say there, there was this one dude that we, um, our friends would, one guy had his, his like, brother-in-law was this cool, like, partier guy that was a little bit older, you know, older, like, mid-20s or whatever. And he was like, I don't care, man. Go get a, you go, go use my name and get a fake license. Cause, you know, so we go into the DMV and go, oh, hey, my name is Rick Crump and, uh, I lost my license and, but I changed my address. Can I get a new license? And they go, yeah, sure. So they take your picture and send you a fucking legit California driver's license to, to my parents' house. So I did it. And it means like three other of my friends did it. So we all had the same fake ID. Like we had, we had our pictures on it, but it was the same name. And so we used to just go up to L.A. like all the time. Like in high school, we just every night go up to L.A. and see punk shows and stuff. And so I remember seeing X on Christmas Day. Well, I mean, I've seen, I'd seen him a bunch of times before, but this one really amazing gig was Christmas Day 1980 um, at, at the Whiskey. And it was so great, man. Such a cool show. 
they were at their top of their game, like really, really good. And so, so anyway, when Ray passed away, you know, I don't know if you know, but Raymond's Eric from the Doors produced their first four albums. I did not know that. Yeah, and Ray Ray was the keyboard player for the Doors. So, so if you notice, like if you listen to Los Angeles, there's organ all over it. Oh, like yeah, there's organ that. parts. And that's, yeah, and that's Ray playing, right? So that's Ray Manzarek from the Doors playing with X. So, and he used to sit in with them sometimes, you know, like he would come around and he was still real friendly with them and all that, and he'd come and play, but then he passed away. And so, so when they started doing these album shows, like, I don't know, I guess five years ago or something, they didn't have, you no, know, they're like, who's going to play the Ray stuff? So they asked me. So I'm the guy to play the Ray Manzarek parts with X. And so when they do the album shows, I would go, we went all over the country doing like, you know, the first four albums and I was their keyboard player for those, you know? So kind of an honor. Me and Ray Manzarek are the only two guys that played keyboard for the, for the, for X. That is a pretty, pretty bad cool. ass. <laughs> um, that kind of yeah, gives so. me a side question to ask you, which I don't know if you'll know this or not, but how come they never play anything from Jesus at all? Mm, I don't know the answer to that. Cause it, but it's, it's the, probably because Billy wasn't in the band. Yeah, because I even noticed since they about, just released Alphabet Land, they celebrate the first four records, but they never even talk about that one in Ain't Love Grand. Well, I believe... I mean, I don't think Billy was in the band yeah, he during wasn't. those records. That That's like... Yeah, that's why. He won't play any songs from... Because I love the song Someone's play. Watching You. Hmm. Oh yeah, I remember that one. Yeah, no, they won't. He won't. They don't touch that stuff. It's got to be Billy era or not. They won't play it. I get that. Just because of him. I mean, they would want to do it, but he just, he's not like you know. You can't you can't talk Billy into something like that. It's you know? probably he's, along the lines of like Jack Grisham not wanting to play Joe Wood TSOL. I guess maybe. Yeah, yeah, it is like that. You know, and Billy is even more. And you know, he's a little bit on the spec. Well, he has. Um, Asperger's. I mean, some what you know what I mean. He's a little on the spectrum, and he's super cool. I mean, I love Billy, but you know, you can't. You know, it's just not even worth. They don't even. It's not worth fighting about. You know. <laughs> the the funny um, part is, like, I don't uh, even know the yeah. story of that at all. I know the TSOO story of what happened, but I don't even. I get what you're talking about, but I don't even know why he wasn't in the band. Well, you know, but here's the thing. Like, sometimes it just runs its course, and then some people are just like, I can't do it anymore, man. Like, I don't want to do this anymore because we didn't make it big or whatever, or, you know, or we got dropped from our label. So certain people have desire to continue, and others don't. Billy was like, I just want to go make amps and shit or whatever. You know what I mean? And it's, just, it's as simple as that. Like, people just get burned out, and they just can't do it anymore. They just don't want to do it, you know? Did you play on I think that's what happened with him. I did not, no. They they don't really want... I mean, the keyboard thing is more of a legacy thing, you know? I mean, I certainly would have if they wanted me to, but they, you know, Billy didn't even want keyboards on. Um, he didn't even want Ray to play in the beginning. And so he doesn't really like having keyboards with X. <laughs> I mean, we're friends, and I like him, and he likes me, but, you know, the truth of the matter is he'd rather not even have the keyboards on there. And so, so when it comes to doing new stuff, they're just not that. You know, whatever. I don't think. I think it's just. I mean, look, they're they're an amazing band. The four of them are special, and it's like that's. I'm super cool with that. You know what I mean? I love yeah. Alphabet Land. I think it's actually a really great record. And um, funny enough, Rob Schnapp produced it, and Rob is the guy who mixed Fiddler, the first Fiddler record, and has a long association with with my kids' band Fiddler. Yeah, I, I, I read. Do you know about it. Fiddler? I did actually read about that earlier today. Yeah, my two sons are in that band, Fiddler, and they're great too. I don't know if you've checked them out, but they're definitely worth listening to. And um, and yeah, so it's all these weird little circles. And then my sons have this, a side band to Fiddler is called the Small Wigs, and they've toured with X, and because they're friends with John too, and they know you know they've the Small Wigs has done done a bunch of stuff with X too. So it's weird how these things, you know, these circles just get smaller and tighter. And speaking of that, um, like that, like for example, I went to junior high with Tony from the adolescence. Like we, this is before punk rock, like in 19, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were pals. Tony Brandenburg is what I call him. But <laughs> <laughs> nice. But yeah, t- Tony Re- Tony Reflex, Tony Kadena. His real name is Tony Brandenburg. But but we, um, yeah, we went to junior high together, and so we were listening to like you know, Sweet and the Rolling Stones, and you know whatever, just all the shit that was starting to happen. And then like the Ramones came out. And, we were just in the beginnings of punk rock and stuff. And then he winds up being in the adolescence and I want to be into it as well. And so we've been friends since we were 12, you know, 13. And same with Soto. Like me and Soto know each other. Steve Soto, we knew each other from church camp. Like there's this thing called, we were both went to Quaker churches when we were kids. Like it's weird. I don't know how that worked out, but there was this place called Quaker Meadows and we both were at Quaker Meadows together. And knew each other, you know, and it's like we wind up being in this punk scene. And I was telling you about going to that first punk show um, with the plugs. Well, it was the plugs in Agent Orange, and Steve Soto was playing bass for the Agent Orange at that oh, time. Wow, that's an early so, show then. Oh, yeah, yeah, real early. And so, and then we've been friends, I mean, we were really close friends and had a band called the Black Diamond Riders together which is like a soul band with Johnny Two Bags from Social Distortion. Johnny Two Bags. And a, yeah, and Johnny's great. And a, and a horn section, and uh, Warren from Cadillac Tramps, and uh, Jamie from Cadillac Tramps, and Steve was the singer. And so, yeah, and we did a bunch of shows and did some recordings and stuff, but the Black Diamond Riders is that band. And so it was cool. Before he passed away, we got a chance to do that together, you know? So that was fun. We got to be in a band together. Yeah, it's actually thanks to the Vandals that I know who uh, Johnny Schubax is because they have a song that they wrote about him. I mean, I, I've known uh-huh. about Social D for, for, for forever, but you know the song by the Vandals I'm talking about? Uh, I don't know. It. Nuh-uh. Um, about Soto? No, the Johnny. The Vandals wrote a song about Johnny Schubax. Oh, about Johnny Schubax? Oh, okay. Oh, cool, cool, cool. I can't. No, I don't know name. that song. I have to look it up. Um, it's about <coughs> him. Is great, it's man. about him having the blues. Like, I, you'll, you'll, it's off yeah. of their, um, I think, Live Fast Diary album. But I also read in another article that you've been. Uh, is it? Would you say your last name is again? Keen. 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 It's pronounced Keen, but who knows why? Keen, like Peachy Keen. Keen has composed music for scene and hero stand up to cancer and um it says you've done hundreds of television commercials. Yeah, that's my main job is I do I do music for T V commercials. So yeah, you can see all that stuff like uh, I have this my website is Polygro Music, www.polygromusic.com, and you can see some of the stuff that I do. But yeah, I do like, you know, car commercials and beer commercials, whatever. I do a lot of commercials. You've I've done a lot of those. Life. Like, oh yeah, yeah, it's a lot, lot, a lot of stuff for sure. Um, but uh, but yeah, and that's like, um, but it's cool. I mean, it's great. I mean, I, they pay me to write music for shit. It's amazing. You know, I mean, I love it. Yeah, it's, and it's fun too because it's like you know, like I'm, I did something different all the time, man. But I I'm pretty good at doing a lot of different styles of music. And I play a lot of instruments too, so I play you know. I can I play guitar and bass and stuff and a lot of other weird instruments and so you know it gives me they just basically pay me to screw around in my studio all day so that's pretty cool. <laughs> nice. But but yeah yeah so the, yeah the commercial thing is sort of like my bread and butter. And I do like commercials for Hyundai and commercials for Adidas and stuff like that you know so they hire me to do the music for that kind of stuff. How much do you get paid for one of those usually? Oh, it varies, you know. I mean, but it's good. I make a good living, you know. I don't like to talk about specific numbers, but but it's I, I but I make a good living and I'm grateful to get to get paid to do music, you know. It's a it's a cool gig, you know. And it says here, but um, it's uh, oh sorry, go ahead. Oh no, that, that's all. That's all. Go ahead. I've seen Suburbia, but I haven't seen Repo Man. So was Repo Man your first film that you worked on? Yeah, it's the first like soundtrack that i did anything on and i didn't do the score but i mean it was those guys from the plug and that's how the way i met them was because i played with bob dylan with the drummer dude and so the it was with charlie kitana they call him charlo and he wound up yeah he's that guy i was saying who wound up playing drums for sd for a number of years and so um but yeah so those guys i kind of kind of became like the fifth plug or whatever so they would bring me in on sessions and stuff and so they got this gig 
it was the singer Tito Lariva and the guitar player Stephen Huffstetter who were the composers on Repo Man. And then so the plugs were like the house band for that score. And then they brought me in to do like all that like, uh, kind of synth stuff and like like all those little choir voices and strings and stuff. I did all that stuff. And so, yeah, so that was, uh, you know, that was like the first, I mean, that was after Suburbia, but I didn't do the score for Suburbia. Um, you know what I mean? I was just in it. So, yeah, that was the first, first kind of movie thing that I got to do. And it was weird because it was just like, you know, I mean, it was cool because it was like, oh, this is a cool movie or whatever. And Iggy Pop's doing a song in it. But we never thought it would be like, Oh, like a, some kind of classic or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like it's this. Who would have thought? Maybe it's just a B movie or whatever. But it's like crazy how it's like you know a movie that matters. You know, the same with Suburbia. You know, I mean, it's like it's crazy how many kids that like that's their intro to punk rock or whatever. You know, my um, so um yeah. I think the first punk rock movie I ever saw was the other F word. Which I know you're in that one too. Oh, okay. Or featured in it at least. Yeah, yeah. Me and Dwayne, and that's another thing. Me and Dwayne Peters did a whole album. It's only on vinyl. I got to put it up on Spotify one of these days. But we <laughs> did this thing called The Great Unwashed. Well, it's actually on Bandcamp. You can hear the stuff on Bandcamp. Just uh, Dwayne Peters and The Great Unwashed, and that's just me and Dwayne, like similar to that record I was talking about with Jack. Uh, where I just play all the instruments and write, help you know, uh, like with, you know write or co-write the songs and then you know have them sing on it and so that we did a whole album of like it's kind of it's it's actually really good man that's a great record it's like it's like tom Dwayne peters doing tom waits you know what i mean kind of thing you know because i think Dwayne's great man he's so talented but he's you know it's 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 tough because i can't always you know work with him because just whatever i mean i'm whatever it's just some people are just tough to work with or whatever but we were friends but it's just it's got to be under certain conditions that i'll work with people but but anyway we came together for that record and it was really really cool you know and so yeah so that's a song from that record i mean it was it's funny because that song was before we did the album but you know we had submitted that song for the movie or they heard it or whatever. And so they, and they really loved that. Or maybe, maybe we had done the whole album. They used that version. I can't remember what the deal was, but yeah, it wound up being like in that film. So that was a, that was, a, that was cool. On the, I like, uh, I like Dwayne. On the topic of TSOL, just, just so you know, I think I told you this over messenger. You let's see Jack Grisham, Joe Wood, tiny Antonio, you're the fifth member of TSOL who I've interviewed. <laughs> oh, wow, cool. Oh, that's great. I'm trying to get you're a hold of Ron and Mike. Through it. Yeah, I'm trying, trying to reach yeah. out to Mike and uh, Mike and Ron, but they're kind of busy. Or, actually, Jack Grisham was the very first punk rocker who I ever interviewed in 2017, and then, unfortunately, my audio file corrupted and I lost it. Oh, no. I was so sad about that, and... Since then, he, him and I have been trying to schedule something, but you know, Jack, he's insanely busy, so it hasn't happened yeah. again yet, but it will at some point, which I love the Trigger back, Complex. Backups, which... backups, backups. Huh? Oh, thanks, man. Oh, thanks. I'm glad you like that. I like that record, too. Yeah, that's a good one. I, uh, sometimes it's... records just happen in a cool way, and it's just, you know, it's it, just, it just magic happens, you know yeah, what I mean? It's kind of like and that was Shadows definitely Part one. Two, honestly. What's that? I kind of, I kind of say, uh, uh, fuck, Tr the trigger complex is like beneath the shadows part two, honestly, because that's what it feels like. It's got that, yeah, no, it's I got that tone that. to it. Uh huh. No, I, I agree. I, I think that that makes sense for sure. Yeah, I, that is a good one. Uh, yeah. Were you on the? You're on the Ghost Train seven inch too, right? I am, yeah, yeah, yeah. I co-wrote that song too. Um, oh, you co-wrote it. Yeah, that nice. was a good one. Yeah, yeah. Most of the stuff, you know, I'm I'm in on most of the writing on most most of everything. I mean, me and Jack write together a lot. And, you know, it's usually some combination of you know a lot of trigger conflicts with me and Mike and, and and Roach actually, and then you know, but a lot of times, usually it's me and Ron and Jack. You know, that's usually the core writing team you know but it varies you know what i mean it's always it's always it's a, 
yeah. different. But me and Jack have written a bunch of lots and lots of songs together for different things and all that. So, yeah, I'm usually on the on the writing end of it too. Just because I do that, sh- I mean, I do that shit for a living. You know what I mean? So yeah. I kind of know it's pretty automatic for me. You know. Are you gonna be featured in the uh, new t- new TSOL album that I guess they're working on? I've heard. Well, there really isn't an album in the works. The big thing right now is just the this Dance With Me 40th anniversary release that's coming. And I may be doing some stuff on that. We're talking about that. Because, yeah, that's a little secret I can't talk about. But we're we're doing some stuff with that. But, yeah, we're just doing mostly just singles now. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I'm, I'm always in on it. You know, whatever it is that we're doing, I'm doing it. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do another record one of these days. Do you know, I, it's been uh, kind of fun just doing, it's been fun just doing like one-offs and singles and stuff and just yeah. not having it be a whole album concept late, you know, lately, like the past couple of years or whatever with the one thing and the sweet transvestite that, I don't know if you heard that one, but that's coming out on, on vinyl. Do you want um, me to censor you hear the cover of- I was going to ask you quickly, do you want me to censor out that part where you said it's a secret, or? About what? You said something was a secret, do you want me to leave that part out of this, or do you want me to keep oh, it? Oh, no, out? I don't care. No, I didn't say the secret, so it's oh, okay. okay. I was like, <laughs> yeah. wait, does he want me to keep that in or not? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. You can leave it in. It's better better, better to have a Easter egg tease. Suspense. Than not. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, so we have that coming out, the... Yeah, the, somebody's going to put out the Sweet Transvestite version. Did you hear that one? Um, I think I did. I'm not sure. I've been really busy working yeah. lately, so I probably I might. Okay, yeah. So of... that's a cool version. It's like you know that you know Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yes. It's the it's that song, Sweet Transvestite. We did a cover of that, and that's, that's the one that we, we put Morris, it right? out. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Bitchin'. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's listen. cool. That was that was fun. So yeah, so we're just kind of doing that kind of thing. Like we'll just get a wild hair to do a cover, or, or like with the Ghost Train thing. We got a couple songs. We're like, okay, cool. Let's do a seven inch with somebody or whatever, you know. So um, yeah, so it's fun. It's fun to get to still do that stuff. And you know, we will. Yeah, there's and there's some secret shows coming up too because yes. there's yeah, there's something. Yeah, I can't <laughs> talk about it, but I can say I can say that there is something going to happen soon. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about no, Beneath no. the Shadows for a moment, just to give you my introduction to it, sure. because funnily enough, which you might laugh at this, I grew up as a hardcore punk kid, and for the longest time, I mean, I've always known Dance With Me, every punk knows that album, that's just, you know, that's essential stuff there, but the first time I heard Beneath the Shadows, I didn't like it at all, because I felt it was too soft, and five uh-huh. within five years or so... A lot of people thought that. Yeah, like, when I first heard it, I was like, ugh, this isn't it, this isn't superficial love, Blah. and then as I got older, now, that's one of my favorite albums of all time. Like, it, it seriously oh, grew cool. on me. And kind of the same for the Trigger Complex to a degree. When it first came out, I was like, meh, they're getting, they're getting soft. And then, like, right. I started listening to it more, and I was like, you know, actually, this is really enjoyable. I'm really glad that TSO oh, hasn't good. just been code blue, you know, all them property stuff. I'm, I'm really glad that T.S. Soul has changed up their music throughout the years and went into different transitions with different music and all that, especially like on Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Free Downloads. It's uh, it's different. T.S. Soul is always, in my, at least to me, fusing punk with piano and other instruments and different music styles. I really enjoy that about them. And it's probably why they've been at it for 40 plus years. Yeah, well, the thing about TSOL is just, you know, it's, and punk in general, it used to be a bigger umbrella, you know, it's not it's just, just like lockstep sort of stuff, you know what I mean? It's like that would be, uh, punk was a bigger umbrella of stuff. I mean, you know, you listen to all the bands like The Stranglers and The Damned and Susie and the Banshees. and I mean, that's a broad, just right there is a broad yeah. spectrum of music, you know? Damn right but it is. But people, you say punk and people think it's one thing. It's No, it's not one thing, man. It's a lot, it's a pretty it's a bigger umbrella than most people give it credit for. And we always take it, you know, we always try to take advantage of that umbrella, you know, I mean, and just be, do whatever we want to do. I mean, TSO was always doing different stuff. I mean, I was, like I said, I was a fan before I joined the band. So, you know, I mean, weathered statues is great, man. You know, dance movie is great and everything's different than everything else. And exactly. so we have these shadows is different. And then, you know, 
Trigger Complex is a little different than that, but in the same vein. But then Life and Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Free Downloads is a different kind of vibe. And you know what I mean? It's like we've got we just try to just do, you know. I've always kind of something. considered Disappear to be like the sequel to Dance with Me to a degree, and then Divided We mm-hmm. Stand kind of just. Oh, float. Jack, that. Huh? Oh no, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Yeah, I get it. I I can see that. Did yeah, you say yeah. Don't tell Jack that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's not. He would probably be. I think he would probably be all right with that. That I think that that's cool. And then what's the one uh, divided we stand? Yeah, that's after is, uh, despair. Yeah, that's the one where I kind of first got back in. Uh, so I, like, yeah, we were talking about how I, I played on that, and so that was when I first started back playing back with them again. Um, cause I was busy and not that interested in doing it and everything, but you know, we just kind of started talking and it was just sort of like one of those things that my kids were just starting to play punk rock and they had this band. That's a cool band to check out. Check out the diff D I F F S my diff? boys. My, so yeah, my, so my two sons, Elvis and Max that are in Fiddler had this band called the diff like in the you know like early 2000s and there was a crazy punk revival going on then you know like everybody was dragging it back out you know i mean like you know the germs were even playing shows you know with that guy shane west singing the guy who was the actor in the, in the germs movie and my kids were huge germs fans so they got to play a bunch of germ shows and got to know pat and you know i don't know it's just really really and lorna was super cool to them because they were like these little baby germs because they had the singer it was like this little Darby Crash kid and so they so anyway so uh, my kids were playing shows and doing all that and it it just kind of felt right to play with TSOL again and they wanted me to come and play some shows and so then yeah that was the era you know like the early 2000s when we started playing together again like you know I can't remember what year but somewhere in there you know like maybe right 2001 2000 something like that so it's been 20 years like since we've been doing it again together um so they had been doing it for a few years before that because they did disappear and stuff. But that that was the record where they kind of wanted me to come, you know, asked me to come back and, and play, you know, so that, uh, uh, you know, Divided We Stand was sort of like my re-entry into the band and stuff. So you uh, you didn't ever play with the Joe Wood uh, TSL at all? No, but I was friends with them. I mean, I knew them really well. I mean, Mitch Dean's an old friend of mine, the drummer. I've been you know, actually trying to reach well. him, actually. Joe, Joe is oh, really? easy. I I, Joe's easy to reach, but I I can't find any traces of Mitch Dean anywhere. Yeah, he's around. I mean, I haven't talked to him in a long time, but I'll see if I can find him. I'll send him your way. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Uh, um, I haven't talked talked to him in a bunch, but but yeah, it was um yeah. So I was I was actually in the studio with them. I mean, I wasn't playing because it was whatever. But you know, but I, I remember going down to the studio and they were recording demos for that stuff and those around because at some point me and when me and jack split up and i was still playing with dylan i was friendly with those guys and talking to them and you know whatever it's like it's all we're all friends it's not big it wasn't like i hate you because jack it's just like jack hates you so i'm gonna either i gotta pick one i don't want to work them. well i really i always i was i was like working with jack i mean we have a good relationship and stuff and it just what I wanted to do was more in line with what me and Jack were talking about than what those guys were doing. But, you know, I, they wanted me to be in that version of TSOL, but I just, you know, I had kind of had to pick, you know? Yeah, I get you. Uh-huh. And we never should have broken up the band in the first place. It was just stupid. And it was just people getting angry and egos. We should have done, we would have made a really cool record. The next record would have been amazing because we had a bunch of songs that were really, really cool. For Some real? of which we've recorded again. Yeah, again is one of those from Divided We Stand. Again was one from that was from back in the day. And there was a couple others that have reemerged, you know. But um, but yeah, we had there were, were some dem- um, demos that never that, that disappeared. That we were that would have been like the foundation for the next record, you know. But whatever, it's was water there, the was bridge, there talks you know? on our next record back then? What's what's that? Were there any talks on our oh, next record after? Oh yeah, we would have done. Yeah, we would have done another record. Sure. I mean, it's just that. We had this big falling out, you know, and and Ron, you know, I think definitely Ron and um, Ron and Jack, you know, mostly, you know, whatever. Just I was gonna ask you, what was the uh, what was the core of the falling out? I remember Jack told me bits and pieces in 2017, but 
like I said, that interview has been corrupted. Do you remember any of it? Like what really? Just creative caused... differences, you know, and je- creative differences and jealousy, you know. I mean, oh. part of it, I think, was that you know Ron was on just he was just roading on tour with the with the Dead Kennedys, but I think there was some miscommunication and misinterpretation of stuff that you know they wanted him to play or something. Jack, at that age, he's cool now. I mean, we, we, but you know, he was prone to jealousy maybe a little bit, and I think you know he took things personally and interpreted things differently than they were really happening maybe a little bit and, uh-huh. and so it just created this like uncomfortable situation between the two of them mostly so you know shit happens what are you gonna do yeah because even you know, joe that's how wood, bands break up joe wood even told me with my interview with him that he and jack lived together for like 10 plus years and they got along just oh, yeah. during that time no, and yeah, it's the weirdest thing because he was married to Jack's sister. I know, he told me that. Weird, so fucking weird. Yeah, but no, Joe's cool. I like, I like, I've always liked Joe Wood. He's a good dude. You know, it's just, it's not just. It's just sometimes things come to an end and people want to not do it. Jack just didn't really want to do TSOL anymore. I mean, he wanted to do something else, you know, and that's what we were. He wanted to do Cathedral, you know. We could have, we should have just kept doing. Yes, well, but yeah, at that age, you just don't know. You don't realize when you got magic in a bottle, and that that this yeah, is exactly. the thing that you have. You know what I mean? You say, "Oh, yeah. well, fuck, I can do it again with this other this other group of guys, or whatever." And that was a cool band, but it wasn't TSOL. You know, TSOL is a unique combination of members, and it's just a thing. You know what I mean? It's like, and so you know, we all appreciate that now. But it's a, when you're a teenager, you don't always like. You know, you're 20 years old, and you think you can, you know, just do whatever you. want there's just not that kind of like thoughtful thoughtfulness about it you know it's kind of funny because i remember when i was i'm 26 by the way when i was like 13 or 14 oh, cool. like i knew dance with me and beneath the shadows and them and i had changed today but and i mm-hmm. and this is how kind of slow i am sometimes but i remember just listening to that album and thinking Damn, Jack's voice is different in this album for some reason. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I, I Why didn't did have, you sound like Jim Morrison all of a sudden. I uh, got it from LimeWire. <laughs> I didn't actually have the physical CD, so I didn't know that. I was like, then I then I got the CD. I was like, oh shit, that's not Jack Grisham at all. Yeah. No wonder. It's like, how does his voice get that's so funny. deep all of a sudden? LimeWire. Wow, that's that's a blast from the past. LimeWire. Yeah, that's how I used to get my I music when I was Wire. little. I'm mm. from a town of oh, like yeah, four thousand yeah. people. That's it's a uh, in Kansas. I mean, I live in Illinois now, but yeah, I I, I felt so dumb after I realized that because I was like, yeah, I sh- it should have been obvious if it was a different singer, but you know. Yeah, yeah. No, you don't know those things. You know, I mean, it's like, I mean, you know a lot about the band, and look how much I'm telling you that you don't know. You know what I mean? It's like it's yeah, just this always is a gold line of information right here. There's always arcane. There's always more arcane information. <laughs> That's why I really want to interview Jack again, because since 2017, I know so much more now, and I could probably have a six-hour interview with him and keep it going and going yeah, and going. Right. And he's, right, he's right. hella busy, Let's though. stay on him. Hopefully, you can, yeah, he'll break him down. Keep keep on him. Um, yeah. Uh, just another couple questions here, since we've been on here for almost an hour, which, seriously, thank you so much for that, man. Um Oh, you're welcome. I just, I read this earlier as we were talking about your movies. Um, what is Meet the Hitlers? Oh, it's a documentary about people named Hitler. <laughs> and it's out. It's, it's trippy, yeah. It's about the, but not, you oh know, it's just like, and what that's like. Like, what's that like? What's that like if you're named Hitler? Like, how the fuck, you know what I mean? Like, what, how, what, and so it's just like this kind of like character study of these people who are named Hitler. And there's like five First different name or people. Last name? Last name. Oh, well, no, actually, one dude, his first name is Hitler because he's from South America. And funny enough, like, that was sort of a thing down there. There were a lot of people, like, his name is Hitler. His first name is Hitler. And it's because of those expat Germans who went down there and, and lived in South America and stuff. And, you know, it's like, it's weird. You know, it's, it's a trippy movie. It's actually really cool. It's a director that I've worked I'm with. I'm going to have to watch that. Question. Yeah, yeah, I think you'll like it. It's kind of quirky and weird. I just read that. I was if like, anyway, what the fuck? Me, the Hitlers? What? Yeah, and that was with this director, Matt Ogans, who I've done a lot of movies with. We've done like four or five films together. So that's the other thing, too. Is like I do music commercials, but I also score films and 
do that kind of thing. Like I like I don't know if you ever saw the Code Blue little short, but I like I did the music to that to like the underscore music, you know. And then funny enough, like what we did on a lot a lot of the score for that was like there's some TSOL themes. Like I used um um uh, what's that one? Uh uh be, um Darker My Love and Code Blue and a couple other ones like I incorporate those into the kind of orchestral score, you know, so that was kinda of fun. Damn. This yeah. is one of the most inf- informative interviews I've had in a while. Oh, good. Oh, good. No, it's always fun to talk about all the old stuff. Yeah, and I've actually genuinely yeah. learned things from you. Like, there's there's times where I'll ask a question that I know just so that people who, you know, come by my channel can learn something new. Like, for instance, when I interviewed Keith Morris, I already know the story of Black Flag, but I asked him that just in case someone else who's watching doesn't know. But I love it when I learn new things. Yeah, right. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, no, it's cool. It's good. Well, it is part of the whole little pastiche of the punk history stuff, and it's nice to, you know, nice to be able to share it and have the people that are, you know, I had a look at, here's the thing, man. It's like, it's so cool. I'm just grateful that people still care and that we get to still play. And, you know, when people show an interest, it's like you want to, like, share that information because Hell it's like, yeah. it's you know, it's it's neat that, it's, that people still care. You know what I mean? Like, who knew? Like, I even like I stand with Repo Man or whatever, or Suburbia, or just TSOL in general. It's like, who would have thought all those years, 40 years later, people would still give a shit, you know? I not me, you know? So it's a real, like, blessing and, and cool thing to get to still do this. And when we play, there's always another batch of 15-year-old kids, man. You know what I mean? There's yeah. always a batch of kids that are checking out this thing, this punk rock thing, and they want to see PSOL, and they want to see the adolescents, and they want to see whatever, whatever. They want to see these bands, as bands they still can, and, you know, you, that's pretty rad, you know? And, you you know, I mean, we get, like, I mean, there's three generations of people at our shows sometimes, you know? There's a dude on my age, or older even, maybe, you know, like, old punks, who then their kids are there, and then there's, like, grandkids there, <laughs> You know what I mean? The kids of the punks my age are like freaking, old, I mean, old enough to have teenagers practically. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, you know, or t- you know they got eight, 10, 12 year old kids. So you got grandpa there and you got dad and you got, you know, little, little whippersnapper doing his first stage dive. And that's pretty crazy. You know what's funny about all this shit, yeah. though, about punk rock music? And you might find this comical, as I said. I'm 26 and, uh, I remember in a, back in high school, about seven, about a decade ago. God damn, I can't believe it's been that long. But anyway, know, right? about when I was in high school listening to punk music, I remember blasting TSOL, Dead Kennedy, DRI, and all that. And so many elderly people in my town are like, oh, you kids, and you're, you're in music from today. And I'm like, this shit's from the <laughs> 80s. Yeah, right. I all, yeah, I this never, is classic rock. That's funny as shit that some people were like, all oh, that new punk rock stuff. New? New? Mm-hmm. It's not fucking new. It's older than Think I am. Think about it. It's, it's, it was older than it's older than, uh, than Chuck Berry was in the seventies. It's just amazing because you know I mean? like back... that's only that, that was only twenty years old. Like in the seventies, <laughs> you'd think about somebody from the fifties, like Elvis or Chuck Berry or Jerry Lee Lewis. That's only twenty years later. We're talking like forty years later now, or then when you were in high school, it was thirty years later. So. You know, it's kind of like, wow, you know? Yeah, my, I remember but, when you I, know, no, it's good. I played TSOL for my mom once because she, her bands, she, you know, Metallica, Def Leppard, and the Backstreet Boys and all that shit. I remember she, I played huh. TSOL um, Superficial Love for her because I wanted to piss her off because the F word was in it. She hated, she hated foul language. But um, she's like, why huh. do you listen to that garbage from these days? I'm like... Mom, you were born in 74. This came out in 80, 81 or 82. She's like, no, it didn't. They didn't oh, custom funny. rock music back then. And I showed her the album. And she's like, what? How? <laughs> she's like, I never heard that on the radio. I'm like, yeah, there's a reason for oh, that. that's funny. It's, 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 oh, yeah, it's that's hilarious. Funny. Yeah, yeah. No, it's cool that you're into it. I mean, it's great that you're, you know, a fan of, of the stuff. And, and, you know, I appreciate people who want to archive this stuff and get all the stories you know that's an important role and i appreciate that you do that you know 
I mean, that's a cool, that's a cool Yeah, that's why I'm taking your know, story, it's, man. It's nice. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. I, it's not lost on me. I think it's a cool thing, and I appreciate you digging in and thinking about the past and all that. Of it's course. funny. I, I'm, I just booked this job. I'm going to do the music for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame show, which is going to be on. It's going to be on HBO next month, and so and it's it's crazy because it's like you know. I'm going to do, I get to do the music under Dave Grohl doing the open and I get Holy to do the music shit, that ties man. all this stuff. Yeah. I'm going to do the music when under, when Iggy Pop is inducting Nine Inch Nails into the Hall of Fame and stuff. It's crazy. So. I bet you, I bet you predicted yeah. that back in 1982. <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, although I always did want to write music for films and stuff and, and you know, and, and I thought that would be really cool, but I'm, in fact, here's a cool story. I, I do have to go pretty soon, but I'll tell you one more little cool yeah, thing. Man. The guy who did the guy who did the music for Suburbia was this guy named Alex Gibson. I think I've and, this, and yes. and he was in a band called yeah yeah he was in a band called B People, and which was really cool. And they were like they were like friends with Forty Five Grave and that same that world of like you know Forty Five Grave B People. All that, and I love Forty Five Grave. They're really, really Sleep cool. And and that safety. guy, um, Paul Cutler. Paul Cutler was like was like produced a lot of bands, and he produced B People. And I always really liked B People, and so I um, that was a real inspiration for me because I'm like, he's just a dude from a band, man. I could fucking do this. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I could do the music for a movie like this, and so. Me and Alex wound up being friends. He after B People, he had a band called Passionale, and Passionale opened up for the Church on a little tour. And I was in the church in 1984, you know, the under the Milky Way and all that. You know that band, the yeah. church? Yes, I've heard of yeah, that. Yeah, so I played with them. Yeah, and I played with them after Dylan. So we became friends, and we wound up scoring a film together called From Hollywood to Deadwood. <laughs> and then and then we and we did a lot of recordings together and stuff, and what, we talked talk about working together. But I always admired him and thought that would be cool, and so we wound up being friends and, and collaborators. And Alex is a music editor now and has been for a number of years. And he won an Oscar for, uh, for I forget what movie it was. It might have been, been Batman um, for music editing. Sorry. And so, um, I'm so I'm proud of him for that. He's, he's, uh, he's, 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 a, he's an awesome dude. But he was one of my early inspirations and we wound up being collaborators and friends. And so, uh, and I, you know. No, and I played on his records and stuff. And I remember I played on like the B people and Passionale records, and, and so not B people, but yeah, but, but later stuff, Passionale and all that. So anyway, so that's another little tidbit for you for the suburbia tidbit. Thank you for all this information. It's a gold mine. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Yeah, it's fun. I got a little checkered past, you know, whatever. You got a it's you got a busy, fun. busy, busy but, life. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's good. I'm grateful. You know, it's good to get to do all these cool things and um, you keep. To, you know, it's so so cool to get to know all these punk rock people for all this time too, because we're like this little, you know, fraternity that's been together for you know off and on whatever, but for like 40 years. You know, I mean, it's crazy. Hell yeah, it is. You know, it's pretty pretty nuts to be able to have those kind of long term relationships with a lot of different people. You know, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, man. Well, is there anything else you wanted to yeah. add to this? You've given me an hour of your time, and I'm so appreciative of this. No, I think I think we're good. Oh, definitely check out Fiddler, though. I think you'd like Fiddler. I totally will, man. Because they're, yeah, because that's my boys, and they're older than they're they're older than you are. <laughs> Funny <laughs> enough, yeah, Alrighty. just a couple of years, but still, but the, but they're great. And and check out the disc because that's another little piece of the puzzle of the punk rock uh, of my little punk rock world and they played but the, the time they, they used to open up for us and the, they played with the adolescents and the circle jerks and agent orange and blah, and the germs and this is crazy yeah they played tons and tons of shows but that's how they cut their teeth and that's where that's what came that's where fiddler came from hell yeah dude. that was like the first their first band so yeah well that was cool man i'm glad we i'm glad we got it i was actually thinking we we're gonna do it tomorrow but when you said i'm gonna call you in an hour i was like Oh, that's perfect, man, because I just finished up all my conference calls and all that stuff, and it worked out great to do it today, man. I'm glad we did it. I'm glad we yeah, managed Yeah, sorry I didn't do it last in, time. What happened finish. was um, I do DoorDash, and so I told you I got uh -huh. hit by a car a couple of weeks ago, like middle of August, and my moped was oh, destroyed, right. and so me and my best friend have to share my minivan, and I can only work when 
she's not using it, which we, we're getting a car next week, so that's going to change, but I was getting ready to go home and do that, and suddenly, oh, but looks like I'm working the rest of the night, never mind. <laughs> so, that's, yeah. that's exactly no, what happened. No, it's okay. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad we managed to make it make it work, and this worked out good today, so Hell now to it's good yes. time with you. All yeah. right, man. Yeah, well, awesome. Well, I, Killer, well, have a great, send me the link when you got it up or whatever, if you need anything else, just keep me posted, but yeah, there'll be more, more stuff coming up, fun, fun things should be happening, and, uh, and uh, I'm going to see Jack this weekend, so I'll, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll put in a good word for you. Hey, I, I really want to read, read, read Come on. Yeah. <laughs> talk to the boy, yeah. he needs to talk to Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well. I'll, I'll, I'll work on him. <laughs> Excellent, man. Well, great talking, and have a good weekend, and, um. I'm glad you're doing the doing the good work. We'll we'll do it forever, bro. Have a lovely night, man. Cheers. Sounds good, man. All right, have a good one. See you next. Bye bye.